Picture the scene. It is 2014. Kawasaki released some patent drawings about a 1,000cc motorcycle with a supercharger. The motor in press go crazy. And it wasn't until 2016 that we actually got to see the infamous Kawasaki Ninja H2R, which is the 320 horsepower track only weapon. A few years later at the Eichma show, Kawasaki released the Ninja H2, the road base version of that motorcycle. Some complained that it was only 200 horsepower. Why was it down on power? But the bike was exceptionally special. Seven years later, I own a Kawasaki H2. Join me and I'll tell you why this bike was so special in 2016 and today in 2022, why it's even still as special as it ever was. Jopsy, roll the intro. This is how a Kawasaki 750 Mark IV is made. Making a motorcycle takes a lot of effort and experience, and Kawasaki goes to great lengths to ensure all Kawasaki are made as carefully and perfectly as possible. Kawasaki has been known throughout the years as a manufacturer who pushes the boundaries. From its 750 H2 triple, which set the world alight in the early 70s. To determine maintenance and service And then the GPZ 750 Turbo in the early 80s. Several turbocharged motorcycles have been developed to date, but none have achieved just the right blend between weight, power, and performance. Until now, that combination has remained out of the reach of engineers. Until now, that is, putting the new turbo through standing 400-meter sprints in an impressive 11.2 seconds. Later, American rider Pee Wee Gleason slashed this to 10.71 seconds for the quarter mile, making the Kawasaki 750 Turbo the world's quickest production motorcycle. Kawasaki was always pushing the boundaries of speed and performance. Kawasaki hasn't rested on its laurels since the 80s, and continued to develop in many industries from aerospace to shipping. And then in 2014 it was time to push the boundaries once more, it was time for the age of the supercharger. And the H2R was born. The H2R was designed to be the pinnacle of sports motorcycles and produces an incredible 320 horsepower. The bike bears the name of the original 1970s H2 triple. The H2 features many cutting-edge technologies, silver metal paint produced using a chemical reaction a two-speed supercharger using aircraft-derived planetary gears. Even the frame building required specially developed robots to produce a very high-quality final product. Kawasaki didn't leave it there, the H2R was only the beginning and five months later the road-based H2 was unveiled to the public. Eight years later the Kawasaki Ninja H2 is still one of the most exciting and special motorcycles on the road today. Chops, over to you. So the Kawasaki Ninja H2. Where where do you even start with this motorcycle? Where do you where do you, where do you even start talking about this bike? As I mentioned at the beginning of the video, you know these came out in 2016. The H2R came out first. You know, imagine that the H2R coming out, 320 horsepower carbon fiber everything and then they said don't worry there's going to be a road based version coming at the Eichma show in November whenever it is so when they announced and showed off the H2 version and it only had 200 horsepower as you can imagine going from 320 horsepower to 200 horsepower people were a little bit disappointed that Kawasaki hadn't done a little bit more with it you know and at least brought out 250 horsepower I think Kawasaki didn't do it just from they didn't want to be seen as being irresponsible <laughs> you know producing a, a 250 horsepower road bike would you know it's going to raise some eyebrows isn't it and they didn't want to be that manufacturer to do that the H2 was always about a showpiece of you know showcasing what Kawasaki heavy industries are all about but we'll come on to more of that in a minute 
but when the H2 came out there was some disappointment what it did do very well was it had bags of torque so it may have been you know s 1000 rr power figures but it had loads of torque compared to the s 1000 rr the heart of this bike is of course that supercharger so how you know how did they develop that supercharger well if you weren't aware Kawasaki Motorcycles is just one division of Kawasaki sort of global if you like they're also involved in aerospace shipping um, all sorts of things space you know space development as well Kawasaki have got their fingers in a lot of pies and basically what happened is when they decided they wanted to produce a supercharged motorcycle because remember they had at the GPZ Turbo, the 750 Turbo from the 80s, they were turbocharging bikes back then. They realised that supercharging was a much better way of, uh, you know, forced induction on a motorcycle because you didn't want that turbo lag, you wanted instant power. So what Kawasaki wanted was a, a centrifugal supercharger. It's like a two-stage supercharger which ramps up a gear and spins faster at higher RPMs. Now, first of all, Kawasaki Motorcycles contacted a few, you know, supercharger manufacturers and said, these are the specs we want. Um, can you make us this supercharger? And the answer was, it's impossible. I won't go straight on because that guy's going straight on. They said, it's impossible. It can't be done. Don't say that to Kawasaki. They went and spoke to their turbine division and said, we want to do this. They said, let's make a bike between us, the whole he Kawasaki Industries, let's produce a showcase motorcycle and that's exactly what they did so they produced the supercharger in-house it's uh, centrifugal as i say it's got planetary gears which is the same technology used in jet engines and the beauty of it is they wanted a unit which actually doesn't need they didn't want to put an intercooler on the bike because it adds a lot of unnecessary weight so they wanted this supercharger which was fast produced it a lot of boost but also didn't produce a lot of heat basically the whole bike is built around that supercharger there's no consideration for the aesthetic look of this bike this bike is a hundred percent function over form and that's the that's why it looks like it does and you either love it or you hate it one of these because they don't look beautiful but they just look menacing because they're made to be functional first of all function has a very similar engine to the H2R. As I said, the H2R is 320 horsepower. The H2 engine is identical, you know, the head's the same, the block's the same, the pistons are the same. The only difference with the H2 compared to the H2R engine is the H2R has different cams, obviously higher lift cams. It has a different ECU with obviously different maps. Uh, and it runs more boost pressure. That is really it. So you can take this engine to the same level as the H2R, but then of course you are, well you're 320 horsepower on a road bike, I mean it's, it's just getting silly. <laughs> when does it end? about my h2 my h2 isn't standard it's a 2017 bike i bought it when it was a year old but it only had one mile on the clock it was just pdi and then it sat in a dealer you know, just as a showpiece really it hadn't been used it did have one owner but that was actually the dealer which had the motorcycle so it was a brand new bike for all intensive purposes with one mile on it 
it's now I've, this is now my third year of ownership when i got it obviously it was completely original completely standard and in that time i've gone through it i've i'd like to think improved it i know a lot of people believe that these should be kept absolutely standard you know you shouldn't mess with them well of course i've done all the work myself to this bike so all of the standard equipment i've got it all tucked away in the loft so if I want to return this bike to 100% stock, I can do that. So I don't see a problem with doing mods as long as you're keeping the standard equipment and can return it to standard again one day. So that was always my plan. <laughs> so it was about two years ago, I sort of decided that the standard power figures, well, you know, it wasn't lacking power, it was an absolute weapon. But I thought, you know, Kawasaki have designed this bike and they've strangled it, really. They're running this bike standard at 200 horsepower is really strangling it. And the way they have to sort of uh, restrict it to 200 horsepower is by having the throttle bodies closing from 10,000 revs, you know, upwards. So the throttle body slowly close, loads of fuel's pumped in, but the air is cut off and basically the bike's starved, you know, and it only makes 200 horsepower. By just a simple uh, de-restriction, you know, by just making those throttle, where are these guys going? By just making those throttle bodies stay open 100% when you've got the throttle at 100% and obviously correcting the amount of fuel going in, you can make 250 horsepower out of these very easily. And that's all this bike is. I think this was 248 horsepower at the back wheel with the baffle in, because I wanted it mapped with the baffle in because it's just too crazy loud with the baffle out. So this bike is 248 horsepower at the back wheel or something like that. That's at the back wheel. So remember, you're probably losing another 15 horsepower through the transmission. So it's probably like 265 at the crank. Plenty enough for anyone, I would argue. So here it is, my 2017 Kawasaki Ninja H2. Now, as you can see, I've done a few mods to this machine from when it was brand new back in 2017. But let me talk you through some of them and some of the details of this machine, because this bike has an amazing presence on the road, but it's not until you get up close to it and you see the details that you really start to appreciate it for what it is. So first off, let me share with you some of those welds I was telling you about. Special processes were designed to get these welds looking like they do. Actually done by, done by robots. I mean, a lot of people have said, you know, these, these welds must have been just cleaned up afterwards, but that is how they come. That is how these welds are finished and then the bike is painted. So, you know, special attention to detail just to make the welds on the trellis frame look special. The chrome black paintwork you can see it sort of picking up some reflections, well hopefully you can on the camera, and sparkles, it's got a bit of sparkle in it. It's a matte undercoat with a specially developed process which creates a silver top coat. This isn't paint, this is actually silver. This is actually real silver created in some technical chemical reaction and uh, Kawasaki sort of perfected it. The later bikes from 2019 had self-healing paint so in the sun when it got warm it would actually any scratches would start to knit together and heal itself to a degree obviously but the 2017 is not self-healing it's just um, sort of standard paint finish but it's in you know that it's the paint it's little details like the special finish which just make this bike look so incredible in the flesh. The rear seat has like bolsters <laughs> to hold you in now that's how fast the bike is it's got bolsters and these are actually adjustable there's like three positions where these can sit depending how big your bottom is with my bottom obviously they're all the way back it's maxed out to give me maximum room but these actually can if you've got a smaller house if you're a bit smaller these can move forward to about here to sort of lock you in to that tank for those top speed runs the H2R had a full titanium system and this system on this bike is made by Van Diemen and it's actually a copy of the H2R system. It's actually made better than the H2R system because the H2R system is prone to cracking. So Van Diemen have recreated it for us mere mortals to put on our H2s, but it's a full copy of the H2R system in polished titanium and it just looks absolutely incredible absolutely finishes the bike off so if you're looking for a system for your h2 
the Van Diemen is absolutely beautiful. And I run my bike with the baffle in. It's just so crazy loud with the baffle out. In the UK, you just won't get away with running the baffle out. They're just too noisy. So I run the baffle in just for the sake of my neighbors and my ears. On the left-hand side of the bike, you've got that inlet, which takes you straight into the supercharger. So then, as I mentioned, you know, air throughput was key for this bike. So it's only on the left-hand side, you've got a snorkel which directs air directly into that supercharger from the big mouths at the front of the bike. Now the H2R, both of these, you could have air going in. You know, both of these were part of the air scoop because there was no headlight, so it just went straight across the front of the bike. On the Road Boast H2, you've got the headlight in the middle, so only the right-hand side is part of the air, air box. Well, not air box, but the air feed into the supercharger. Whoa. The whole bike is wind tunnel tested. So these are the H2R wings, um, but the whole of the front end is developed on the, in a wind tunnel, basically for aerodynamics to keep the bike stable at speed. And also these little scoops here to scoop as much air as possible into the air box. But it also feeds and pushes air into the radiator because Kawasaki didn't want to have a great big radiator on this bike. So they kept a sort of standard size radiator and cooled it efficiently with the aerodynamics. So a lot of time was spent, you know, wind tunnel testing this machine, basically, creating this aero, creating the, the design. You know, these little side pods on the side here. So the idea being, Kawasaki didn't want to produce a, a great big long motorcycle, because obviously if you want speed, you can increase the wheelbase to gain speed. They didn't want to do that. They wanted a bike which could handle as well. So they used the aerofoils on the front and the side to create downforce to keep the bike stable at speed without having to stretch it. So all those with stretched H2s, you're just gonna, you've gone against the whole principle of what Kawasaki wanted for this motorcycle. Keep a bike which handles, but has that stability due to the aerodynamics. I've also fitted a Moto Composites carbon cowl because normally the H2 has a, has a silver cowl as well, but I've gone for sort of that H2R look with the with the aerofoils, the spoilers, and also the carbon front cowl. Ooh, sexy. The 2017 onwards bike come with an Olin's rear TTX shock. The early ones, I think it was a sack shock. All of the H2 and H2Rs have the KYB front forks. I have indicators in the clip-ons because I don't have any mirrors on my bike, so I don't have the indicators integrated with the mirrors, so I have them in the clip-on. The dash on the 2015 to 2018, is it? Or 2019 is an, is an LCD dash, but I think it's one of the nicest, classiest dashboards in existence with these lights which light up as the rev counter goes around. Analog rev counters, you can't beat them. I actually much prefer that. If someone said they could, they could fit the TFT version on this bike for nothing and just swap it, I wouldn't do it. I really prefer this analog version. So there it is, my Kawasaki Ninja. H2, an incredible motorcycle. Let's jump back on. Power, more than simply fuel and flame. It's a collection of forces working in perfect synchronization. A supercharger born of Kawasaki turbine power. Flawlessly machined metal, meticulously crafted aerospace bodywork. Together, these forces unite in the spirit of our undying quest for greatness to create something that's built beyond belief. So let's have a little bit of a tickle. I mean, this bike, it's very important. That if there's ever a bike, I'm pleased I've got traction control on. It's this bike. And I've got it on level two. It's got an IMU as well. It's one of the first bikes to have an IMU, this. And, you know, it needs one, to be honest. Absolutely crazy. What problem I do have with this bike? Is it's a little bit snatchy when it's running in full power mode. That is because when I had it mapped, we didn't have much time to perfect the sort of initial throttle response. So I'm actually taking this back and we're going to correct the initial pickup of the throttle because it's really, really, really aggressive 
And if you go around a roundabout like that, it's very easy to get you know, like on and off. It's very on and off. It's not very pleasant. The throttle response on this bike takes a lot of finessing. And if you're in a corner like that, ugh, it's horrible. So I'm going back to see Chris at CJS and we're going to sort that. So that will be coming later on actually. Probably next month we'll be taking this back just to get the mapping finished on the initial throttle opening. So uh, yeah, look out for that video. And then this bike will be perfect. What with my clip-ons, the higher clip-ons, I've got 20mm higher clip-ons, I've got the Louis Moto seat and the new gel. It's uh, it's really nice. It's much more comfortable than it was. Much more comfortable now. It's a big old bike, but you know, Kawasaki wanted to produce a sports bike. They wanted something which would handle. They wanted something with a, a short wheelbase go around corners and that is what they made yeah it's a little bit heavy because you've got superchargers you've got metal plenums you know you've got a dog ring gearbox a heavy duty gearbox to handle all that power there's a lot of additional weight when you put a supercharger on a bike and I think that the H2R was about 220 kilos the H2 Ninja I'm talking about was about 245 kilos because of that extra weight you know the big the big exhaust big steel exhaust big stainless steel exhaust with like the aura regulations etc so this one because I've now got the titanium exhaust I've got a lightweight lithium battery I've got the carbon fiber cow well that carbon fiber doesn't weigh much but I've got titanium bolts I'm probably about the H2R weight on this I think I'm around about the 220 kilos which for a sports bike is, is 20 kilos heavier you know than a lot of the modern sports bikes but it's still you know 20 kilos is quite a lot but it still handles well enough you know you know it doesn't be I don't really notice that extra weight it's a little bit of extra weight it's not masses of extra weight it's the throttle response is more the problem see how it pushes on when you give it the tiniest amount of throttle <laughs> That's corrected. I think it'll be incredible. in Europe they're no longer for sale because the bike doesn't meet Euro 5 and, and they don't sell enough of them to warrant Kawasaki investing and making it Euro 5 compliant so in the UK at least you can no longer buy a new H2 and looking on Auto Trader, looking on eBay they seem to be drying up all the second hand ones and the prices are starting to go skyward because you can no longer get them 
I don't know if that's the same for the rest of the world. I think in the States, I think people are still getting new ones, but in Europe, they're no longer being sold because they're not Euro 5. So, as an existing owner, that is quite interesting, you know, residual values of the H2s. They've always been held their money really well because they are so special. But now, you can no longer buy them. Hmm. I think the prices are going to be going in that direction, so I will certainly be holding on to this. The H2 SX has a different engine, it's got a different cylinder head, different pistons, different conrods different mapping obviously, different supercharger as well. The H2 SX isn't built the same as the, as the H2. It doesn't, you know, it's not built on this special assembly line with the special welds done on the frames. I mean it's still a lovely bike the SX but it's not as special as the Ninja. So in my three years of ownership have I had any problems? The bike's only got, I think it's got about 3,700 miles on it. So it's just, you know, I don't use it that often, it's, it's, it's about just under 4,000 miles on the bike. It's been running this sort of 245 horsepower for about two years now. I've had no issues. I've had one problem with the bike, and that was the clutch um, slave cylinder was jamming. I was getting some gr horrible graunchy feeling at the lever, and I thought there was something wrong with my clutch blades because I also fitted the, the Brox uprated clutch springs. And after I did that job, I got this horrible gr graunchy clutch. And I'm like, oh god, I've done something wrong with the clutch plates. And I had, I'd put a clutch plate in the wrong way round. Thanks for the person who pointed that out to me, I had done that. But I corrected that and it still didn't fix it, it's still like this horrible graunchy clutch. And I go out for a ride and it would be like they couldn't even pull the clutch in the end, it was like, oh, oh. So I did a bit of googling, as you do, and apparently it can be a common problem with the slave cylinder sort of just catching on the rod. There's like a slave cylinder which pushes a rod through to engage the clutch. And where it's on like a very tight, machine slot you know it, in the actual slave cylinder it can get gaunchy it can catch and people said just put a lot of white lithium grease in there and put it back together again that's what i did and it's been fine since i've done that but apparently for some models karazaki did a recall of that slave cylinder but i never got a recall about it so i don't think mine was one of the ones which was meant to be affected but i did have this gaunchy clutch so that's the only issue i've had i've had no other problems whatsoever it's been as good as gold in life, you will meet those motivated by fear rather than desire. And they'll be sure to warn you about the dangers of the unknown. They'll say, be careful. It's a wild world out there. But look in the mirror and ask yourself, what's more frightening? The wild unknown or a life of quiet desperation? The supercharged Kawasaki Ninja H2R. Built beyond belief.